13 years ago on the first Sunday in November, I stepped up into this pulpit for the first time, and I was scared to death, which in the first service I could say today I was all over again. Yeah, uh, why the fear? Uh, more than half of new church starts don't survive the first year. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to plant a new church, and it's gotten more difficult. Uh, more than half die in that first year, and then in the next couple of years, they continue to fall off the map, so to speak. It's very difficult for a new church to get its feet under it. It's very expensive, for one thing, to you know, keep food on the table of the pastor and pay the rent and all of the other costs that there are. There's a myriad of expenses that's a part of starting a church. Previously, before I came here to do this, I served at Concord United Methodist, which is down by Jackson. I was fresh out of seminary, and I was relieved to find out that that church was 150 years old. There was nothing that I could do that would take it down. <laughs> They'd lived through a lot, and they would live through me. So I stepped up here and very aware, though, that in this church it could fail and very easily. And in many ways, the, the life of a church uh, rises and falls on the pulpit, on the person that brings the message. So I felt this huge responsibility on my shoulders, uh, afraid that it, I had this one chance to try to get people to come back the next week. You know, I prayed, please, Jesus, <laughs> let people come back you know, the second week. Now, I, I felt that responsibility on me. I felt tremendous responsibility for the people that had helped me do this. I had about 40 people, and they had sacrificed so much. They had spent hours and hours and hours putting this together. There were so many things that they didn't do because they did this instead. They didn't always sit home and watch television with their family or a video. You know, they didn't go road, ride their motorcycle. They didn't spend time scrapbooking or whatever it is that you like to do. They sacrificed all of that. And I felt that very strongly on my shoulders that day. Everything was hanging on that one hour of worship. Now, I know that some people are here today who are what I would call day one people. And if you're a day one person, you know who you are. And I wonder if you would stand. It's always interesting to see. I know Thomas is going to stand. My husband Bob's going to stand. He's definitely a day one. Oh, oh my gosh, it's the Richards, isn't it? Yes, you survived. And there's Jackie and George. Yes, it's amazing. Thank you. Yes. You owe them a big thanks for what they did. Now, I, I, that's my husband Bob sitting there. He was out. Uh, greeting in the parking lot. That's what he always used to do. He wore these Mickey Mouse gloves and particularly greeted all the children. You know, there are kids that still remember Bob. They don't know who in the world I am, but they remember <laughs> Bob. So he loved kids. He, more than kids, in addition to that, he's a wonderful gardener. And they're going to put some pictures up on the screen. Uh, some are his flowers and some not. These are daffodils from this last year. We just planted an additional, like, 50 bulbs. It's going to be beautiful. That's kind of the entryway to our house. And he has all of these plants in there that do different things at different times. And he's always moving them around. He, he, to get them in the optimal place for that plant, he'll say, it obviously wasn't getting quite enough sun, so I need to put it over here, and I'll move that one back there. He's always got his hands in the dirt. And, and he says that's when he's the happiest, is when his hands are in the soil with his plants. He loves that. I planted some zinnias this year. Occasionally I'd plant something. He's got a green thumb. Mine is marginal black, actually, on some occasions. But uh, I planted zinnias. They're an old-fashioned flower and very beautiful. And I, that, that was great fun. The bees and the butterflies had a wonderful time. Bob does so much for his plants. You know, he weeds them, he feeds them, he waters them, he moves them around. He fairly prays over them, you know. He breathes on them and he loves them. But why do they grow? In the end, when you really get down to it, why do they grow? Say it again louder. 
That's right. And I want to read to you, this is from the Gospel of Mark. This was Jesus. He was talking about growth. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. He could have put in there, it's amazing for Jeremy. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, no matter what he does, the seed sprouts, and he doesn't know why. Bob can do all he wants to do, but it's God's work in the end. You see, it's God that grows flowers. Bob, his responsibility in it, and he does this, he totally cooperates with God in this mutual endeavor in the garden. It's a mysterious and wonderful thing. In that scripture, uh, Jesus starts by saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And what he's talking about is us. He, he's talking about the church, the kingdom of God. How does it grow? And he said it's exactly the same thing. You see, it's just like planting something in the ground. God makes flowers grow, and God also makes the kingdom grow. God grows churches. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the, the growth in the kingdom of God. This in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7. He said, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Now, he was speaking to the church in Corinth, the church that he planted, just like I planted this one. And he says, I planted the seed. Yes, that's Barb. Apollos watered it. That's the pastor that followed him. Who would that be? Tom. Tom watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants, Barb, nor the one who waters, Tom, is anything, but only God who makes things grow. We have totally cooperated with God to the best of our ability in this mutual endeavor that we have here with God in this church. SCC has grown through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, a question I have then, as I was thinking on this, is how did God ever get me around to where I would cooperate with him in any endeavor? You know, Tom has this uh, group that meets where he meets with atheists and agnostics and people that are non-believers, and that's exactly where I would have fit in the 1960s. First I became an atheist, and then I became an agnostic. When I learned the word, I thought it was the coolest word, so that was what I was. And agnostic just says, I don't know if there's a God. It can't be proved in any direction. That was the group that I fit into. And Christians, to me, were comical. You were funny. I made fun of you behind your back any chance I got. And then life moves along, you know. And I got married, and I had a couple of children, and life got a little more difficult than I had envisioned. Uh, you know how it is when you're 18, and you think you've got everything figured out, and then you live a little bit, and you discover that, no, it isn't quite like that. I began to struggle with the big questions of life, and I didn't have any answers, I, no answers at all. Um, so I began to search. You know, last week, Dottie talked about searching, and that's exactly what I did, as we all do. We all have to find our own answers. Nobody can do it for you. I looked into the occult, just like Dottie said last week that she did, and actually looking into the occult helped me to find God. Now, I wouldn't suggest to you to go look in the occult because it's a dangerous place to go. I was, it was very much a work of God that he protected me in that. But I looked into it, and in my reading, I discovered this very interesting thing, that Columbia University had a department that studied parapsychology. 
parapsychology is all the woo woo eerie things that supposedly happen. And I read that and I thought, well, that is really weird because these are university people. These are educated people. How can they possibly be investigating something weird like that? And as I reflected on it, I thought, maybe I had missed something. Maybe they, there really was something there in that woo -woo spiritual realm that I just wasn't aware of. All of a sudden, there's these intelligent, educated people looking into it, and that's what opened this little window in my mind, just a little bit. And it was just enough for God to slip in. Then a friend of mine brought me a book, and I've always been a big reader, and she brought me a book called Beyond Ourselves by Catherine Marshall. It was a wonderful book, and I was reading it one night. It was February the 13th, 1969, about 11.30 at night, sitting in my living room, and God just stepped into my living room. I don't know how to explain it or adequately describe it. I'm not saying that I saw God or anything of that nature, but I was so surrounded totally by the presence of God, I could hear my heart beating, I could feel my breath. It was actually kind of a terrifying moment. I didn't believe that God existed, remember? I was an agnostic, actually, said you couldn't prove one way or another, well, you could prove then, at least to me. I was sitting there reading, and I, was, I had a cigarette in my hand. Uh, I'd been, I was smoking the last cigarette of the night before I went to bed. So I sat there with that cigarette in my hand, and God said to me, now this was not an audible voice, but it was very clear, and the words I'm going to read to you are exactly the words that came in my mind. Barb, you need to put that cigarette out. I gave you your voice, and if you take one more puff of that cigarette, It'll be like you're thumbing your nose at me. I had a lingering cough, and I love to sing, and that's what God was talking about. This was definitely working against me. I knew that I had to make a decision. Now, when the God of the universe steps into your living room, you don't fart around. It was the moment. I paused, I hesitated with the cigarette. Now understand, I still had five packages of cigarettes out in the kitchen cupboard. You never quit smoking when you still have cigarettes. They're too expensive, yeah. So you finish the package or you finish the carton. And I'm thinking about that, oh my word, you know. But God was in the room and I realized you know, I could wait until tomorrow morning, but it, I might have missed the moment. So I put it out, and everything changed. God stepped from my living room inside me and began to grow me up. You know, God grows flowers, God grows churches, and God grows people. He begins to work in you. God had seen me looking for answers to questions and stepped into my living room and then began to grow me up. And he had such a project on his hands because I was the one that made fun of Christians and all that kind of stuff. I thought I was so smart. But you know, God was up to it. I brought my Bible here. All you have to do is look in the Bible and read about the people that are in here to know God is up to whatever the situation is that you're in. The people that God works with in the Bible are the most motley crew of people. And somehow, he has done all of this with them. If he was up to me and all of those people, he can handle whatever mess you're in. But there are many forces that will work against you, and I want to talk about just one of them. And that one is fear. 
fear is the enemy. Fear is an enemy particularly for me. I have always been a fearful person. One of the things that I loved about Bob when I was dating him, I always felt safe with him because as far as I could tell, he wasn't scared of anything. And that was exactly what I wanted in the man that was standing next to me. I wanted to feel safe. When I was about three years old, my folks took me to a movie downtown in Lansing. It was in Michigan or the Gladmer, something like that. And uh, it was a movie for children. I was only three, but there were previews. And my parents hadn't been aware they were going to preview Frankenstein. Yeah. It was the one with Lon Chaney and Boris Karloff in 1944. That's how old I am. Oh, my goodness. And my mother, of course, the minute she saw what was happening, she grabbed me and tried to put my head down in her lap, so cover my eyes so I would see it. But it was too late. I had seen something up on the screen, and you want terrified? That's me. Well, I don't remember what movie I saw at all. All I remember is, you know, getting, seeing what I saw on the screen at Frankenstein. We got home, and that night, I went into the bathroom and went absolutely berserk in the bathroom, screaming, terrified, just a mess. And my dad and mother come in, they think I'm being murdered in there, you know. Maybe someone was hiding him. Oh, I had seen Frankenstein out the bathroom window. I was convinced of that. They calmed me down. See, I've been scared ever since I was a little child. And it's followed me into adulthood also. Bob at one time ran a speedway station, the one up uh, by Frandor. And he would have difficulty getting reliable help. And I was pretty reliable help. I was trustworthy. Um, and I was working for him one Friday night. And wouldn't you know, two men came in and robbed me. One of the men had a knife. And I can still remember the absolute terror that I felt. I couldn't look up at these men. I couldn't have identified them. Good grief, I couldn't look at them. My head was down the whole time. The man with the knife, they kept telling me what to do. They didn't want to attract any attention outside. They just wanted to get through this, get the money and get out. So they're telling me what to do. And all of a sudden, the guy with the knife says, it's OK, lady, it's OK. <laughs> you know, this is definitely not OK. <laughs> it's OK, lady, it's OK. Why did he say that? I was so terrified. He was afraid I was going to fall over in a dead faint, which would attract attention, and the whole robbery would be thrown. Um, you know, it'd be a mess, and they wouldn't get their money. So he's trying to. Com he's comforting me. I'm like, well, put the knife down then. It'll be more effective. But anyway, how did it all come out? Here I stand. I'm fine. I gave him all the money in the drawer, very willingly. I even told him about the drawer that I had down underneath. They didn't know anything about it. I gave that to them. I would have carried things to their car if they wanted it, whatever. Just leave me alone. Um, I tell you that because I want you to understand, I've been scared since I was little. And it's easy to scare me. It's a powerful force in my life. And Satan will always use whatever your weakness is. And Satan would always come at me with fear. Now, that's what it was for me. I don't know what it is for you, but I know that every single person has that tender underbelly where Satan can get to you and stop you from growing, stop you from moving ahead in life, stop you from serving him. Fear was what it was for me. The enemy will always be there to try to drag you down. First, from becoming a Christian. Remember, I was the one that laughed at all the Christians. Who was going to have the last laugh now? I would be the butt of the jokes. Changing my behavior in so many ways. I had a mouth that needed to be corrected. Uh, I had to learn to do things like say grace before meals. And in front of other people. That is so embarrassing. You know, real, I'm these are big things in our life as we move along. 
going to seminary, changing our whole life, turning everything upside down for Bob, spending all that money, and what if the whole thing was a huge flop? That's something to be scared of. My first appointment, I was the first female pastor at Concord United Methodist Church, and what I didn't know was that there was a lot of fear about a woman coming to be the pastor. There were some people in the church who had said, that at the first worship service when I stood up to preach, if, if, if she says anything ungodly, what was I gonna say? I don't know if they thought I was a witch or something, I don't know, but they were scared of me. And if she does anything ungodly, we're gonna get right up and walk right out of this service. I didn't know that, but as I walked in the service, I saw Sarah, one woman that I knew by name, and I said to her, pray for me. And she said, Oh, I will. <laughs> she knew what I didn't know. I was just scared. All along in my Christian life, it seems like the stakes have gone up. It's gotten more and more difficult, and always the fear has been thrown at me. But I have never, ever backed away. Why? Well... Wait, that's not about me, remember? It's about God. God gave me a verse early on in my Christian walk. It's 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. I have claimed that so many times. A spirit of power, of love, and self-control. I can stand here, I can stand my ground in the power of the Holy Spirit. I can do whatever this is. If I'm a laughing stock, if I fall on my face, whatever it is, I can do that. God taught me about that verse. And he always spoke to me about fear. So that when I was faced with uh, giving my life to Christ, uh, I wouldn't fall into that. When I was faced with learning to pray in public, when I was faced with responding to my call to ministry, uh, when I was faced with planting a church, when the bishop asked me, uh, I didn't give in to the spirit of fear. And I, I just finished reading a, a book by a man. It's called, um, Whatever You Do, Don't Run. He was a, a tourist guide in Africa on um, safaris. They would take tourists out and they would have certain rules trying to keep these people safe. And that was the first rule. Whatever you do, don't run. That's if you run into a lion or a tiger or any of these things, don't run. Why? Yes, you'll be lunch. You'll be dinner. Because when you run, that's a sure signal that you were, you're there on the menu. Okay. Whatever you do, don't run and I never ran, and I'm so glad that I never did. God has given me exactly what I needed to face the unhealthy fear that I carried around ever since I was a little girl. Now, this is a wonderful day in the life of this church. It's a wonderful day in my life. And as I was preparing this, actually I was thinking about all of you. As you know, God, uh, he celebrates with us the past and what's happened here, but God is really all about the future and what's to come. And you're the people that he wants you to, to totally cooperate with him in this mutual endeavor. Just like Bob in the garden, he wants you to do the weed and the feed and the water and the move and whatever needs to happen in order to carry this thing ahead so that it continues to blossom and bloom and gets bigger. And what venue, we have no idea, but God knows. God's got a big part of the a vision, big vision for this church, and you're a part of the vision. So what's ahead? And, and very specifically, what's ahead for you? And what, what's holding you back? What, what's the tender underbelly? It might be fear. It could be any number of things. It could be feeling like you're just too busy, feeling like you don't have anything to offer, uh, feeling that... Uh, People wouldn't want you to do whatever it is that you want to do. It can be any number of things. They're all, they're all lies from Satan. But it can be any number of things that come at you and keep you from totally cooperating with God. 
I'm, uh, my prayer for SCC today and for each one of us individually is that we'll continue to totally cooperate. I'm not done. God, I thought maybe I was done, but he's told me of late that I'm not. So we've got things to do here at SCC, and I hope that you'll continue to cooperate. Um, I love this church very much. You know that. It's in my heart and always will be in all of you people. That I love the church, the church universal, uh, the church that I always made fun of. I love very, very much. Church is a wonderful thing this church that you're a part of here and the church around the world. And I've got a video I want you to see that celebrates the church. <laughs> 